Uh, take your Bible, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you would please, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, I want to say to all of those who are visiting this morning, we appreciate you coming. And uh, my prayer is that we just don't run you right out the door and you never come back. Um, but that there's something here about this place that uh, you'll know that at least you'll know that God's people are here and God's presence is here and that's what we want. And uh, at least on this day you were here and God decided to show up today. So that's our prayer for you. And again, a lot of people are on a journey in life looking for the truth, looking for what church to go to. Some people look everywhere and can't find one. And uh, which has allowed us to uh, build quite a large online following. There's a lot of folks on the other side of those cameras back there watching. And um, we appreciate them and their faithfulness. But uh, the Lord bless you this morning. And uh, we hope to see you again either in this world or in the next. Amen. Um, now, you pray for me this morning, and uh, keep praying for me, so I'll be able to preach this message. Um, I've, I've just, I don't know, I've just since Wednesday, uh, I, may have, I may have picked something up at the nursing home Tuesday, when I was over there visiting Bonnie, and um, I just haven't felt right since then. And uh, so I definitely don't want to pass it around to everybody, don't want to give it away, whatever it is. Feels like a virus, some kind of flu bug, something like that. It's affecting my stomach and all that. I just had a real sour, real sour stomach, real bad feeling here. And um, so it's just, just hard to just hard to get around and do the things that I do when I feel that way. So I appreciate your prayers for me. What I was going to say a while ago is we have a, a very pretty good size uh, presence online. And you listening to this sermon today, uh, if you like it, great. There's a bunch more online. If you don't like it, don't judge me on one sermon. There's a bunch more online. You might like one of those. So just look up Mike Hoggart on YouTube. You'll find it. Uh, sermonaudio.com slash Bethel is our other website. And all of the sermons and teachings that we do throughout the week, they're all archived there. You can watch them as video. You can listen as audio. and uh, Or you can watch our live stream again. And um, we're working on something different with our streaming computer upstairs and to try to stop some of the nonsense. And what happened last Sunday was Windows decided to go ahead and update our computer while we were trying to stream Sunday school. And I'm, I'm tired of that. It, Windows does that whenever it feels like it. And it, and it makes me angry. And uh, so that was the biggest portion of the problem that we had last Sunday, and it, I suspect that it may be this Sunday too. So anyway, just pray about that and pray that we'll be able to find a solution for that and uh, be able to do what God's called us to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Let me get into this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things, pay attention now, because what I've been showing you up on the screen, that is your life. It is your life. I, and I can, I can tell you definitely, 100%, it's been mine. It has been my life, I guarantee you. And I don't mind giving you illustrations out of my own life to show you 
This is some of the dumb mistakes that I've made in life. These are some of the ways that, that my faith was challenged. My love for God was challenged. My love for His Word was challenged. And there's been times when I failed that test. God being merciful as He is, uh, picked me back up, decided He could use me as long as He could whip me hard enough. And He found a way. But that's what it's all about. Verse 5 again, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. I'm, I'm going to preach that message. Not today, but I'm going to preach that message. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. You see that I have up on the screen a little flow chart here. I have a picture of Egypt, which represents bondage to sin. This is where you used to be. This is where I used to be. This is where everybody used to be. There's no hiding it. When you come to a church, you're coming to a sinner's meeting. You're in a room full of sinners. No denying it. No getting around it. Nobody acting better than everybody else because none of us are. All of us were in Egypt all at the same time. God brought us out, but we're not there yet. We're not in Canaan land yet. Many things that the devil is going to throw in our path to try and stop us from going there. Many things are going to happen in your life. As I look back on my life, and I just picked these things out here, the issue that they dealt with at Mount Sinai, when they told God specifically, God, do not speak to us ever again. Use Moses. Have send Moses down. Let him talk to us. But God, don't talk to us again. There you have a... They, they heard God's word, but then, then they didn't want to hear it anymore from God. Then you have the waters of Meribah, which we talked about last Sunday. They chided with God. They complained against God. They, they thought that God was so stupid that He didn't know what He was doing, that He led them into a place where there was no water, and then didn't have a plan for them. And let me tell you something. If I didn't make this clear last week, I'll make it clear this week. Trust God. He's got a plan for you. Somebody say amen. I don't care if you're in the middle of a pit and there's no water in there and you think you're about to die. Listen, God's got a plan to give you water out of the pit. Somebody say amen. In fact, he'll fill it up, teach you how to swim at the same time so you rise up and get out. Amen. Uh, the brazen, the, uh, the Korah. I have Korah written up here. That's who I'm going to preach on today. It's called the gainsaying or the rebellion of Korah. The issue of the brazen serpent, the issue of the ten spies that came back and told them they could not go into the promised land. And Israel fell for every single one of these. And I can tell you that in ways, so did I. So did I. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I ask your blessings upon this message. Father, you know the weakness of my body this morning and of my mind. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless the message. And Father, Lord, that your people would gain strength from it. Father, we would gain understanding. Father, we would learn. God, help us. And God, if you help us do anything, help us to learn to be submissive to authority. Teach us, Father, men, women, children, elders, Preachers, church leaders, teach us 
how to be submissive to authority. You hate rebellion. You hate it. And Father, that truly is a test of our faith. Do we trust the Word of God to follow it? Or do we think that there's got to be a better way to live life without it and rejecting its authority, its laws, its statutes, its commandments, and its precepts? God teaches how to be submissive. Teach us to not rebel, which is tough for Americans. Lord, we pray, dear God, you just bless the preaching of your word this morning. Open up our eyes, open up our ears. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now turn to Numbers chapter 16. This is what the Bible refers to as the gainsaying of Korah. Now, I'm not going to do this this morning. You can do this on your own. But I don't know what it was, but something led me um, years ago. I was looking at this chapter and I was looking at Korah. And it went into a lot of detail to tell you who he was the son of. So I just kind of spent a little time chasing that down in the Bible. And from what I could see, Korah was the first cousin of Moses. So not only was this affecting the entire realm of the people of Israel, it was a family feud as well. Jealousy played a huge part in this. And let me tell you something. I've been in churches all my life. I've been in this church most of my life. I have seen other churches, heard pastors talk about churches, heard stories about churches, and I know a little bit about churches. And I know for a fact that nine times out of ten, when jealousy arises in a church, Jealousy will usually lead to rebellion. It'll lead to rebellion. You get a strong pastor in a church. God's using that man. People are getting saved. Church people are getting right with God. Church people are giving up old sins, old habits. God's trying to mop up sin in that church. God's trying to make something out of that church. And you got a strong man preaching the Bible and he's doing it right. He's preaching it in love, but he's preaching it in strength. Not afraid of the faces of men. One of those sermons is going to rub a family the wrong way. A family. Or a member of that family. And that member of that family will start going against, start going with their other family members. And they'll say, well, I don't like this or I don't like that. And pretty soon you got a rebellion in your church. When I was a young boy here around 1978, 1979, somewhere around in those days, we had a church split. It was one of the awfulest things I've ever seen in my life. As a young man, I wept. Because these were people on both sides. I had been taught in their Sunday school classes. I had been to their homes. I had looked up to them. I revered them as the godly saints. And I just thought the world of each one of them. And I saw the bickering, the fighting, the accusations the name calling over a pastor that they didn't like. And so they decided while he was gone, while he was gone to have a meeting on him behind his back to vote to throw him out of the church. While he was gone, they had the meeting. 
I'll let you know that since then we've changed our bylaws and you can't have a meeting without the pastor being there. Ken Goff did that. I didn't do that. Ken Goff did that a long time ago. He came in and he looked at that and he said, we're not going to do that again. But it was the awfulest thing I've ever seen in my life. One lady got up and there was a man in this church, one of the godliest deacons I've ever known in my life. She got up and slapped him across the face during the business meeting with her husband sitting there letting her do it. That's rebellion. God's not in that. God doesn't bless that. And uh, I have done everything in my power in all the years that I've been here as pastor to try not to let that happen ever again. It brings God no glory. Then you find out Korah, let's read this, number 16, verse 1, Korah, the son of Izar. By the way, let me tell you how that worked out. The pastor won the vote of confidence. So a bunch of people left. But he did not survive the uh, fallout. And in just a few months, ended up resigning and leaving. And I wept in his office because I loved that man. He was my pastor. And I loved him. Whatever he had done wrong, I was willing to forgive him. I didn't know what it was all about. Still don't know what a lot of it was about. But that kind of stuff happens. Happens in churches everywhere. Everywhere. And let me also admit to you, in my arrogant youth, I participated in it once. And it was wrong. It was dead wrong. I met that pastor at a preaching conference. And I went up to him and hugged his neck and apologized. No, I didn't lead the charge to try to get him run out. But I had done some things behind his back in my arrogant youth that I have since, even though I've been forgiven, I've since paid for. I've since paid for. Because it's been done to me. Now, Kor, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses. Underline that in your Bible. They rose up before Moses. They're, withstand, they're standing against him. It's a showdown. With certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Notice that they never like to do it alone. No, no Jezebel likes to stand alone. They figure if we can get enough numbers on our side, well then that'll show that we're right. But is that what that shows? It just shows that more people were wrong than were what right. Than were what right. That didn't, that didn't, that's poor English. That's terrible. Than what were right. There we go. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, and every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift you up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. In other words, who made you God? Who put you in charge? Well, let's answer that question. Can we? Can we answer that question out of Scripture? Who put Moses in charge? God did. Right? They didn't vote on it. 
It wasn't up for a council meeting. It wasn't up for a board meeting. It wasn't up for a church vote. God put him there. God sent him to stand before Pharaoh when none of them else did and secured their liberty away from Pharaoh. Standing there at the, on the other side of the Red Sea watching Pharaoh and all his armies down, you would figure everybody would be running to Moses. Moses, oh, oh we love you. We're going to follow you, Moses. Moses, you're great. And you know what? They may have done that for a little while. But you know how people get. And when Moses heard it, verse 4, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah. See, that's verse 4. I put that up on the screen. When Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will shew who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take ye censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. Now the Bible, you know what the Bible called Moses? The most humble man ever before God. Moses, as with any leader... Could have called for Joshua and some armed men and said, slaughter every one of these guys. I'm not going to have that. But you know what he did? Instead of being seen to abuse his authority or being seen in any way to usurp even his own authority, he didn't do it. Even though he probably had a right to, he didn't do it. He simply called. He said, let's call upon God. Let's let God choose this one. Let's let God figure this one out. When we have, the, the Bible gives us clear pictures. When we have sin in the church and somebody is living in a way that they are not supposed to be living, there is a way that Christ told us to handle that. He said, first, one goes to that person and attempts to bring them to repentance so that we can save the person, not lose them. He said, if that don't work, take a witness with you. Now we got two people begging them to repent, praying, weeping with them to repent. Then if they do not repent, then ask them to come to a meeting of the church and we will say this to the church. We'll lay out the accusation. But let me tell you something. What you don't do first is lay the accusation out to the church. You don't do that. Since I've been pastor here, I've had numerous people come to me and confess secret sins. And they're still here. And you know what? After that point, it's none of your business. I didn't even want it to be my business. But they felt like they needed to tell somebody and they came and told me. I can also tell you that since I've been here, 1996... People have come to me and I've confessed sins to them. You betcha. Because it works the same for me as it does anybody else. Works the exact same way. See, if you follow God's plan, he'll bless it. You go against it, that's rebellion. Okay? So he said, take censers, put fire therein, put incense before them. We're going to figure out who, who God is going to pick. So let me tell you, I wrote down a few things last night. I was kind of feeling a little bit better. I got up out of bed and wrote some things down for you. This is rebellion against God. 
a person gets to the point where they say, I don't need church. I don't need church. You know what one of the things the church is really good at? It's really good at holding its church members accountable. Accountable. For their own sins. The word of God gets preached. Conviction then is laid out by the Holy Ghost and by the word of God. God's people will come, confess their sins without having to get anybody to step in on them. God, God would rather have it that way than any way. Between you and God, that way we don't have to involve everybody else. What is it that Nathan the prophet confronted David with? For thou didst, didst this secretly, but I will do it before all Israel. You try to hide and cover up your sins and neglect confession and repentance. God will start bringing people in. To deal with it. One person says, I don't need church. It's because it's a rejection of the authority of church. And let me explain that. According to what Jesus said, if by that third time you are standing in front of this church and I'm having to tell everybody in the congregation what you did, and you refuse to repent, this church takes a vote, and if they vote to expel you, you are expelled right then and there from the midst of our congregation. That's authority, is it not? That means you cannot come back until you repent is what that means and so what people will do is they'll start letting sin fill their life to such a point as that it has it in their grips and they don't want to get out and they don't want to deal with, they don't want anybody to confront them they don't want anybody to find it out so what usually happens at that point is drop out of church. Why? Because they know ultimately the church has the authority. And they rebel against it. So when they say, I don't need church, they're saying, I can be just as good a Christian as anybody who goes to church. Is that true? A lot of people think it. That'll make it true. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Number two, I don't need some preacher telling me what to do. I've actually had people tell me that. I don't need some preacher telling me what to do. I was in the guy's house when he told me that. He said, I know where your church is, and if I feel like coming to it and being talked to, then I'll come. But until you see me, I don't want to hear from you ever again. We walked out. I don't need some preacher telling me what to do. What makes that preacher think he's better than anybody else? Well, if you know me, I don't think that. Then they turn it against the Bible. Their rebellion. The Bible was written by men. Therefore, I do not have to obey what the Bible says. I do not have to obey it. I do not have to live by it. Or here's one of my favorite ones. Well, we're under grace. We're not under the commandments. You know what a statement like that is? I can sin all I want to, and God cannot do anything about it. That's rebellion. That's rebellion. The Bible was written by men. Now, let me throw something at you just for a minute. 
and tell you yes, the Bible was written by men. Jesus spent 33 and a half years on this earth, never wrote a page of the Bible, did he? And when he came to John in Revelation chapter 1 with letters to the seven churches, Jesus didn't write them. He said, John, write these down. John wrote them down. But you know what the Bible says? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that means that what you find in this book even though it was the hand of John Mark, it was the hand of Paul, or it was the hand of Moses, it was still the voice of God telling him what to write down. It's got the authority that God has in heaven. Somebody say amen. Well, here we go. I don't need government. I don't need government. Besides, they're all in the Illuminati, therefore I do not have to obey civil government. Now let me tell you, that, that, is a, that statement comes from both sides. It comes from, number one, the Antifa side and the Black Lives Matter side, which believes that they have a right to violate other people's rights, burn down property, withstand the police, withstand orders from government, and you've got liberals cheering them on. Until it's Nancy Pelosi hiding for her life on January 6th. Then she says, those, those rebels, they need to be, we need to put them in jail, we need laws against that. But they let Antifa and BLM get by with whatever they want to. Antifa is an anarchist organization that says we will not obey the laws of this land. We will not do it. God says that's rebellion. But then here's the other side. Here's the Christian, right-wing, extremist, fundamentalist, sovereign citizen who says, I only obey God. And if it didn't come from God, I don't have to obey that authority. Now let me ask you a question. Is that true? Biblically, is that true? Read Romans 13. Read Romans 13. All government is from God. And even righteous men though they be righteous indeed, need to be governed. Can I get God's people to say amen? Joe Biden's not my president. He's president. He's president. I don't like him. I don't think he's aware that anybody don't like him. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> You've heard that one, haven't you? I don't need government. Besides, they're all in the Illuminati. Therefore, I do not have to obey civil government. But let me remind you of something. Who was it that put the tribes of Israel under Pharaoh's authority? God did. And 400 years later, when God was ready to receive his people unto himself, when he sent Moses to Pharaoh, he, Pharaoh never, Moses never said, Pharaoh, we're leaving. There's not a thing you can do about it. Don't try to stop us. We're leaving. He did not say that. What was Moses' exact words? What were they? Let. Let my people go. And when Pharaoh didn't do it, God convinced him. And it wasn't until, it wasn't, read your Bible. It was not until Pharaoh said, 
get these Hebrews out of my land and out of my face. I've had it with them. Get them out. When he let them go, now they're free. Or here, this one. Get ready for this one. My parents are stupid. My parents are stupid. Or my parents are a bunch of hypocrites. I don't need them telling me what to do. This young preacher boy standing before you today had a showdown with his father the day before I left for Bible college. And a very lost father to me said, you're going off to Bible college, but you despise your own father. And he was right. George, he was right. I was so arrogant. I thought because my dad was lost that I didn't have to do what he told me to do. And I was wrong. This is Kohath. Or this is Korah and all of his people. 1 Samuel 15, 23. And yes, I am preaching this on Halloween day. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected. Watch this now. Here it is. Not, not the man. Not the government. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul rebelled against, watch it, he rebelled essentially against the Bible. The Bible in the form of Samuel the prophet told him exactly what to do. Saul didn't do it, claimed that he did, and God rejected him from that day forward and said I'm not going to have any mercy on you ever again and the Bible says specifically that God took his Holy Spirit from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord entered into Saul right. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 17 they refused to obey neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of a great kindness, and forsookest them not. Proverbs 17, 11, An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. He's talking about the Antichrist there, I believe. Jeremiah 28, 15, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. And we have preachers standing behind pulpits every day in this country and in, around the world telling people that it's okay to live the way God made you. It's okay to violate the Word of God. It's okay to live in sin. It's okay to keep living the way you're living. You're okay. God made you that way. God still loves you. They are compelling people to sin and rebel against God. God's going to hold them, each one of them, accountable. This is, I'm, listen, I guarantee you, this is how God Almighty dealt with this guy. 1996, 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, and on and on and on and on. Was by reminding me, Mike, it's the word that's the authority. It ain't you. I will cast thee from off the face of the earth this year. Thou shalt die because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Who remembers Gwen Shamblin? Who remembers her? She wrote books back in the early 90s. Way Down and another one. 
She was a health guru, made millions of dollars selling books that told people that if you're fat, you're serving Satan. So all of a sudden now you have 30, 40,000 churches all over the country. Um, I won't get too far into it, don't have time, but they were running her programs everywhere. She gains millions and millions and millions of dollars off of this, divorces her first husband, marries a former Hollywood actor, a guy who played Tarzan, back uh, about three or four years ago, start their own church out of rebellion because she wrote an article where she said that she no longer believes in the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So all of a sudden, all these churches start canceling her and saying, you're not coming to our church. You're not going to teach that here to our people. So she starts her own church out of rebellion. She is Lord Supreme in this church. She's the head pastor, not Tarzan. She is. And she talks, she had just, was in the midst of a teaching series on how greed is evil. And her and six other people got in the front of their private jet on May 29th. And after about a three minute flight, crashed that jet into a lake near Smyrna, Georgia. The guy said it hit at an angle of about 70 degrees at about 800 miles an hour. And there was nothing left but pieces of the bodies that they pulled out of that lake. She was in absolute rebellion to God. For a bishop must be the husband of one wife. And the women ought to keep silence in the church. God still gets in a killing mood. You believe that? You should. Joshua 1.18 Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Isaiah 30, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Isaiah 63, 10, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit, therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Isaiah 65, 2, I've spread up my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Daniel 9, 5, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled and even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. You think the Bible was simply written by men and that you don't have to obey it? You're wrong. God sent these commandments, these judgments down to this down to this earth for us to have a decent life to live. But all we do is rebel against it. Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against Him, there's still mercy for you. God will still forgive you. God will still cover your sin. But God wants to change your rebellious heart first. When is the last time you heard a preacher preach on submission? Husband authority over the home. Parental authority over children. Governmental authority over all of us. Pastoral authority in a church. Limited, limited pastoral authority over a church. Pastor is to never be supreme dictator of everything that everybody does in this church. Never to be that way. He is to be a servant shepherd. He is the shepherd. He holds the staff, which keeps the sheep in line. But his primary business is protecting the sheep and feeding them. Jude speaks of Korah. In this example, these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Do animals obey laws? 
Did you know that deer do not necessarily cross the road where a deer crossing sign is? They don't, do they? Bunch of rebellious. I think you ought to go out next month and shoot them all. That's what I think. <laughs> shoot a bunch of them. <laughs> Brute beasts don't obey authority. They don't obey laws. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Cain wanting to live how he wanted to, yet he wanted God to accept him. And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Lord, I'll preach what you want me to preach. But he's got his hand out to Balak and say, Oh, if you gave me half your kingdom. And perished, perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. You know what, I mean? you know what that means? They're no good. Cared about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit. What happens to trees without fruit? They cut down, cast into the fire. Plucked up by the roots. Twice dead. Twice dead. Do you know what that means? It means that God has already turned them over to a reprobate mind, and they are never going to get saved. They're walking alive here on this earth and are dead twice already. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's what God says about your, your, your rebellion. I've admitted to you some of mine. I've done it. I've done it. And to this day, I carry the scars and the consequences for it, though God has forgiven me. I've had to receive back the rebellion that I exhibited in my youth. Now back to Numbers. Turn there very quickly. Almost done. Numbers 16, 23. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get ye up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went, out, went unto Dathan and Abiram, the elders of Israel followed him, and he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Now, let me just say something. God knows how to make examples out of people. You remember the day when we did public hangings? What were public hangings Four. Huh? An example. And they were swift. It didn't take ten years. They were, they were swift to hand out judgment in the form of public hanging. The Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg desired to be shot by a firing squad because they said, that's a soldier's death. We deserve a soldier's death. And the Nuremberg lawyers said, we're going to hang every one of you. Because it's a shame, right? Cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. And they hung every one of them. Denied them their honor as soldiers because they acted dishonorably in killing over 10 million people. Six million of them were Jews. So God's going to make a public example of, of Korah. Why? 
so that everybody else says, I'm not doing that. It's like the time I watched my mom tie a string to my sister's tooth. And the other end of the string to the front door. Because my sister said, Mom, I have a loose tooth. So Mom tied the tooth here, tied the other end to the front door, and slammed the door. And the tooth stayed. <laughs> and my sister was going, Aah! So Mom said, Oh, this won't hurt. Slam! Ah! So I watched that. And I went. You got any loose tooth? No. I always went up to her afterward, after I had worked it loose and said, Mom, I got a loose tooth. Here it is. No door for me. So God, here's what happened. Moses, verse 25, Moses rose up, went unto Dathan and Abiram, the elders of Israel followed him, and he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tent of these wicked men. Verse 27, So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, hereby ye shall... By the way, your children are going to deal with... You. Your children are going to pay for your rebellion. Who believes that? Mine are. Verse 28... Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, in other words, if they die of COVID, or if they just die of old age, if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit. Then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. So what happened? Verse 31. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words. That the ground clave asunder and that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. And their houses. And all the men that appertained unto Korah. And all their goods. That means their wives and their children too. And they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. You know what happened? Hell itself opened her mouth and swallowed them up. Lest, and they said, and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Now, God may swallow you up in the 21st century in different ways. He may let you get swallowed up of sin, alcohol. Josh Duggar is facing 40 years in prison. Right now, he was arrested. Child porn. They caught him, caught him dead to rights. Because he spent his life pretending to be right with God. They just announced the conception of their tenth child, Josh and his wife. And Josh will probably, more than likely, never see that child raised. I don't have a vendetta against him. I've prayed for him. But it looks to me like because he rejected God's offering of mercy and for God to remake him in a new image, sounds to me like he's being swallowed up of his own rebellion. 
See, that's how God does it now. You rebel against the Lord, you rebel against His Word. There's only going to be misery. You might win the fight in the church. But what does that gain you if you lose your own soul? Now I've admitted some of my rebellions. Things to this day that I wish that I had never done, never said, never been a part of. I had a pastor and I did him wrong in rebelling against him in my youth. And I've begged God's mercy every day for that. And this morning, I'd like for you to bow your head. Man, it's time to go. I bet y'all are wishing I was more sick than I am. Bow your heads this morning. I just want you to think about what's been said. And, and I'm, going to be, I'm going to be real honest with you this morning. I do not have anybody who is sitting in this room in mind in preaching this. God is my witness. God is my witness. Father, we come before you this morning, and we're asking for grace. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And our hearts often are very rebellious. Father, teach us Holy Ghost submission. It is one thing to stand up for what is right against people who do not want us to stand up. It is another thing entirely to just outright rebel simply because we think the government did something wrong or the police department's corrupt or the pastor said something wrong. Lord, all of us who are in authority are human. And we make mistakes. We often abuse the authority given to us. And God, I'm as sorry for that as I'm sorry for rebelling against you. God, I pray, Lord, that everyone who is in authority... Use that authority as a servant would. Keeping in mind the people that are under his authority. Their best interest. What works for them. What makes them happy. But Father, for those who have rebelled. Chasten us, Father. And if we have a rebellious heart, remake it. Father, so that we learn submission. We learn obedience. And we are thankful, God, for the grace that you've manifested to us. Even though, Father, we have rebelled. Father, bless each and every one that cries out to you today. We thank you, Lord, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for the preaching of your word. Dismiss us now in your care. We love you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. As soon as you stand, you're dismissed.